hello. Welcome, everyone, from all over the world. So good morning, good afternoon, and indeed good evening to some of you. We're delighted that you're joining us for the latest in the Innovation Network webinar series from MIT Sloan Executive Education. As most of you know by now, uh, in the spring, as we started grappling with the implications of the pandemic, uh, we moved to this new format of the webinar, both being weekly, uh, so that we can really help everyone really keep up to speed with uh, great and useful ideas from our faculty that can help us through uh, this particular situation and well beyond it. Uh, and we've also changed the format through the summer into this short 30-minute session. So time uh, really passes very quickly. So I will move on to uh, welcoming today's uh, speaker, uh, Professor Fiona Murray, uh, who is a colleague in the Dean's Office at the MIT Sloan School, where she has a number of uh, significant responsibilities which leverage both her expertise and her significant experience. Uh, and uh, you can see here on the screen what, uh, what some of those are. But for today's purposes in particular, uh, we've asked Fiona to join us uh, and talk about uh, the convergence of, uh, of, of two parts of her, uh, of her research work. Uh, one, as one of the world's really uh, recognized experts in the field of innovation. Uh, and the second on the question uh, of uh, inclusion, in particular research that she has uh, been doing uh, over many years uh, on uh, the uh, implications uh, of, uh, of, of gender for entrepreneurs and innovators uh, in terms of uh, her research in this area. So Fiona, I am delighted that you've been able to join us. We're going to talk about uh, inclusion and innovation uh, and your work and your ideas around this, uh, which are having themselves much impact in the world. Uh, and uh, even though time is short, you've uh, kindly figured out how to uh, also share with uh, our audience today some things that they can do uh, to ensure that they are really uh, at the cutting edge of this juxtaposition of uh, innovation and inclusion as leaders. So with that, Fiona, if I may, I will hand over to you and Fiona will make a few remarks. Please feel free to start asking questions in the q and I'll be reviewing those and we'll come back uh, and, and uh, have a conversation with Fiona, inspired in part by your questions uh, after she has finished her opening remarks. So uh, Fiona, over to you. Well, Peter, thank you very much. I really appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to join your webinar. Uh, and I just want to uh, say thank you to all of those uh, out there who have chosen to join us and who have been part of this series. I know how important it is to connect on some of these critical topics. As Peter said, I'm trying to, in this webinar, bring together, I think, two important ideas. Uh, the first is the importance of innovation and our innovation economy. Uh, we know that particularly in this time of economic crisis and a time that we hope is going to become economic recovery, that innovation is going to be absolutely central. On the other hand, we also know that inclusion is absolutely central, particularly, I think, to some of the social challenges and the real social dislocation and crisis that we're also facing. And much of my work is about how you think about the intersection between those two things, how we can make sure that there more individuals are included in the innovation economy and how the innovation economy really can benefit from this much wider diversity of views. Uh, and diversity of ideas, because that really is going to have a transformative impact, whether that's in the United States, in Europe, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, throughout uh, South America and um, in Asia. So these are meant to be ideas that are sort of globally important, even though uh, I'm going to uh, come at those ideas from a fairly North American and, and sort of British uh, point of view, but very much research based as we always think about uh, in MIT. So in the next slide, I just wanted to start by level setting and give you my working definition of innovation. This is a word that can mean many things to different people. So we have a process definition. We think about it as taking ideas to impact. Uh, we focus on the process, not the particular products or technology. And that lets us think about the entire journey. And from the point of view of inclusion, it lets us think about who is involved where in that entire journey of taking an idea through to impact. We use the word impact, not just profit, because we want to really focus on ideas that could have um, medical, social, other kinds of impacts that are equally important. 
Um, and we do recognize that lots of different people are involved and need to be engaged. But the question I want to ask us and pose for today is really, is innovation inclusive in our economy? And is it inclusive in your organization? Whatever type of organization you're in, whether it's a startup, a big corporate, a government, a not-for-profit, are you really uh, including all the kinds of people that you need to get that rich breadth of ideas uh, that really matter? So on the next slide, um, I just wanted to show you some facts and figures very quickly, but because I'm going to cover four questions that I think are the obvious questions as soon as we put innovation and inclusion together. And those questions are really, you know, do we have a diverse group of people engaged in the innovation economy? Um, if we don't, does that matter? What are we losing by not having diverse people in the economy? We might agree that it matters from a social and equitable point of view, but does it really matter from a bottom line kind of point of view? What are the barriers to inclusion uh, in the innovation economy and in innovation activities in general? And how do we overcome those barriers? What are the practical things that we can all do in our organizations um, as we move forward in the next days, weeks, and months? So what you'll see here, there are lots of ways we could measure inclusion in the innovation economy. Let me start from the sort of earliest stages of the pipeline, which is really uh, measures like what's the share of individuals who have the kinds of training that we often associate with innovation. It's not that you need a PhD to be an innovator, but these are some really good and I think interesting indicators. Uh, what they show us, these are just PhDs um, earned by women in various fields from 1966 to 2014. Uh, you can see that it's only in a very small number of STEM fields that we're even beginning to reach kind of 50-50 parity. And particularly in some of the hard sciences and engineering and computer science, which we know are extremely important uh, to the modern innovation economy, we're still at reasonably low percentages. If you look on the right, you'll see that by uh, doctorates earned by African Americans are very, very low in numbers. And so what this is beginning to tell us is that at least in terms of some of the traditional education that you need to really go into the heart of the innovation economy, we still don't see the kind of diversity and inclusion that we would hope for. In the next slide, I'm going to take these ideas one step further and say, okay, but let's imagine that we really are making progress, as you'll see, um, with who is participating at the highest levels of kind of innovation training. Um, are those individuals really turning that training into the kinds of economic impacts? And this is data uh, with my colleague, Mercedes Delgado, who is in Copenhagen, that focuses on patenting. Uh, the pink line shows us the increase in women engaged in uh, STEM PhDs uh, in the top 25 universities in the US. And the orange line underneath it shows the fraction of the patents in those universities that have female inventors. And so you'll see there's this big gap. Underneath is this rather sad gray line that reminds us that only 10% of the patents in the US are actually produced by women, uh, which shows you something about the fact that we are leaving a huge amount of talent uh, on the table. And this is something that we really need to attend to. So there's this big gap. And if we just left these, these lines to just sort of do their own thing, it would take us 150 years for women trained in STEM subjects to actually be fully engaged in the innovation economy, at least with respect to patenting. And the numbers around um, underrepresented minorities um, are even lower. Uh, in the next slide, we'll see, let's sort of put some data on this in terms of dollars and cents. Only 11% of venture capital deals go to firms with a female CEO. Um, in finance, so fintech, it's about 7%. In tech, more broadly, it's about 10%. And when we look at the volume of funding, at least in 2018, only 2% of that money went to companies with female founders, and only 1% went to founders uh, who were African-American or Latinx. And so again, we're beginning to see a real uneven distribution in the innovation economy. And lastly, in our next slide, you can see the other, I think, quite striking fact on the ground. Um, I could look at a variety of different uh, organizations that are really important in allocating money into the innovation economy. We know that more than 65% of venture capital funds don't have a single female partner um, or GP. And so we know that that's important. It's telling us that while there were 50 or so women who became a partner in venture capital for the first time in 2019, now there's still a large number of uh, these really important capital allocating organizations who really don't have representation. And if we looked at this by race, we'd see very, very small percentages. And so what that shows us is that the innovation economy is definitely has a long way to go when it comes to inclusion.
But you might say to me, well, Fiona, it's all very well, and I'm glad that you've done this counting, but does this really matter? And I'm going to argue that it actually does matter, and it matters it has some very significant economic consequences, as well as the sort of social consequences that I think are um, you know, quite clear. So we know, for example, from studies that without diverse leadership, women are 20% less likely than straight white men to win endorsement for their ideas, um, and people of color are 24% less likely. We know from some really interesting studies that companies that have above average diversity, particularly in their senior leadership and boards, show a much greater proportion of their revenue um, coming from innovation than companies with below average diversity. And that that really does translate into stock market returns. There have been some incredibly interesting studies by McKinsey and others that, and Boston Consulting Group that really does um, emphasize that. If we look at parts of the innovation economy that I've just mentioned, particularly coming back to this uh, image and think about venture capital, um, you might ask yourself why we don't have more um, female partners, because we actually know that of all the US venture funds that scored in the top quartile returns between 2009 and 2018, a full 70% of them had women in decision-making roles. So if that was true, then you would think, uh, it would be really an important thing to get more women, more people of color, more diverse people into senior leadership teams. Uh, there's lots of facts and figures out there. And um, when we have more time together on this subject, we can talk in more detail um, about that. But I think there's really ample, hard-headed, well-done economic evidence that what I'm talking about today is not just about matters of social equity, but also about economic performance and the kinds of economic a performance that we will need to move us out of the current economic crisis. So in the next slide, I want to start to talk really about why this is. Right? And we can certainly argue that some of the barriers to inclusion are things like uh, narrow networks. We all are much more likely to have networks and be connected to people who are very much like us. Birds of a feather flock together, I think, is the expression that people often use. Um, and so we know that when we have narrow networks, we tend not to see ideas that come from people who are different to us. And so that narrowing of networks is an important thing. Secondly, we also know that um, innovation leaders, people in decision-making roles, tend to lack diversity. How many of us have, have gone and, and listened to people on what are now referred to uh, quite cutely as manals, all-male panels, including some quite funny examples where there'll be panels about the role of women in the economy and every single speaker is male. Um, when we have that lack of diversity, we know it's hard to appreciate ideas coming from people who are different to us. They don't resonate with our lived experience. They seem more risky. But the third thing I want to hit on is this issue of unconscious bias. Because if it was just a matter of networks and so on, we might be able to intervene in a sort of network rewiring way. But we also know that there's unconscious bias in the innovation economy. In some of my work, I was really inspired by some quite famous um, orchestra experiments uh, that were done um, several decades ago that basically um, asked orchestras to start to interview violinists who had at the time were predominantly male asked them to do blinded auditions and it turns out that if you no longer can see the gender of the violinist playing you're much more likely to choose a female violinist than you ever had been before and so i wondered with my co-authors what it would it be like could we do that kind of experiment in entrepreneurship it's really difficult to do because we're so used to watching people pitch. So instead we used videos, slides and voiceovers and we dubbed identical pitches with a male and a female sounding voice. And then we included photographs that have been pre-coded as attractive and unattractive. And we, un and we asked people, was this convincing? Would you invest? Did the entrepreneur seem competent? And on the next slide, the perhaps unsurprising finding, which is the title of my paper, Investors prefer entrepreneurial ventures pitched by attractive men. It turns out, and as you can possibly see in the rather small graph on the left-hand side, that there is a huge positive effect when we think about as something investable, would you be likely to invest, was the entrepreneur convincing of men over women, and in particular, attractive men. And so the person who is deemed as most convincing would be an attractive man, uh, then um, less attractive men, less attractive women, and then the worst category to be in, uh, in this particular experiment was attractive women. How do we explain this? Well, what we know is that entrepreneurial pitches are about the early stages of the innovation process. When we're in that early stage of the innovation process, there's a lot of risk and uncertainty. 
When there's uncertainty, we fill that gap with what we would call our gut instinct. But we also know that our gut instinct is often subject to unconscious bias. That unconscious bias in some ways has been very protective, uh, but in the innovation economy, it's not. And so that's why in that gap where uncertainty lives, we often see bias creeping in. And I just want to mention some work by uh, a colleague, uh, Dana Kanzi, who is at uh, London Business School, who's done some very interesting work showing that when you have men and women pitching their ideas, the men are much more likely to be asked questions about why their idea is going to succeed, how big the opportunity is, and why they're likely to win. Women are much more likely to be asked questions about the risks of their business, what might go wrong, and why they might lose. And so we really want to think about how bias really feeds into some of the central processes and decision-making processes in the innovation economy. And so my last couple of minutes, let me turn for a moment to saying, what should we do? Because these are important questions, but they are grounded in some pretty sticky things like networks, um, the composition of the senior leadership and decision-making roles, and in unconscious bias. So if we are to deconstruct that, and to create a more inclusive innovation economy, there's no one single magic bullet. And in my experience, that's actually what makes innovation and inclusion a fascinating topic, a really important thing to work on, as I am at the moment at MIT, but also a challenging one. And so I just want to give you kind of four quick things. Um, one is that we need to make a very conscious effort to engage with more diverse innovators and entrepreneurs, making sure that we build and expand our networks whether it's in um, a management school as we think about what speakers uh, we bring in, what cases we teach, what examples we use, uh, whether it be the posters that we show that connect words and ideas to images of certain individuals. We need to be very, very conscious, whether it's in how we expand our pipeline to diverse people when we're hiring innovators and go to different places. Secondly, we need to experiment with inclusive practices that also help expand our networks. We need to be careful not to use language like um, you know, guru when we're talking about coders, words that are actually very gendered or really identify with certain groups. We've run some experiments recently looking at the posters and the information that we send out by email with images to see whether it actually matters who we show as the kind of type of innovator or entrepreneur we're trying to attract. And it turns out from some of our online experiments that it really does make a difference the way in which we communicate, who we hold up as our role models. Third, we need to design inclusive innovation decision-making processes. In the work that I showed you uh, that I did on looking at pitching and how we respond to pitches reminds us that sometimes doing, having blinded um, auditions, uh, pitching and so on can be a powerful thing. Um, we need to think about who's in the room when we start to make decisions in person. And let's think about the kinds of questions. If we know that we're more likely to ask one type of group positive reinforcing questions and the other group negative questions, let's be aware of that. There are some really good best practices from organizations, really thinking very, very carefully about the design of some of those key um, stage gate processes in the innovation economy. And lastly, I think we can establish some inclusive pro-innovation rules. I've been really struck by the fact that Goldman, uh, the, the international bank, uh, has decided that they're not going to um, work with companies who want to IPO if all the directors are white straight men. So they're thinking about putting into place rules that really ask you to be very clear about having diverse comp uh, composition of some of the key parts of the organization. And there are many, I think, of these other small rules that really do shape and ask people not to pick people who are not qualified, but rather to think more broadly about uh, you know, getting a much more diverse group of people into the innovation economy in these absolutely central roles. So four things that we can do, right? Engage with diverse innovators, experiment with inclusive practices, design more inclusive innovation decision-making processes, and establish inclusive uh, innovation rules so that we can really structure our innovation economy in ways that I think will combine innovation and inclusion, both for social progress, but also for really important economic progress. So with that, Peter, I'm going to hand it over to you and say thank you very much. Thank you, for, Fiona. And everyone, please do keep uh, submitting questions. There, there have been a lot and we will, certainly won't get to uh, many of them. So let me just say that we, we will be following up with a blog article to try to get at some of the questions as well.
A lot of them have to do with getting into sort of the data. So if I may, I will uh, put those off for something that we can uh, address better in, in the blog. Perhaps one set of questions that have been coming in have been relating a lot of this research, a lot of your work is, is certainly in the, in the sort of the startup and entrepreneurial domain, but innovation, as you also uh, explore, uh, really is something that we're all doing in every organization we all need to be doing. So do you see these same uh, issues showing up in, in, in similar ways in every kind of organization that's trying to be more or needs to be more innovative? I do, Peter. And so one of the reasons that I talk quite a lot about startups and venture is because it's a place where we can measure things. And so obviously these are things that we do want to measure because unless we put numbers behind this, it's often really difficult to both pay attention ourselves and to know whether we're making progress. But in all the large organizations I've worked with, uh, I've certainly seen many of the same dynamics. So I've seen um, innovation decision-making processes, which are actually often central to innovation activities in large corporations, for example, um, or government organizations. Who's sitting making the decisions, how they're asking questions, um, even the fact that we're all adopting Shark Tank-like uh, activities um, or Dragon's Den like processes inside big organizations, we're actually replicating some of the mistakes that we see out in the wild of the innovation economy inside our organizations. One of the interesting things I think about COVID-19 and all this work from home is it may well be the case that it does lower some of the barriers to participation. People find it easier perhaps to share ideas because we're using very different ways of asking for contribution. And so I'm, I think that some of what we're beginning to see in this sort of crisis innovation mode is a few more different, hearing more voices. On the other hand, we're also seeing that we have to rely on the social networks that we have because we don't have a chance to build new ones. And so that's the downside, I think, of us all being online. So I think these dynamics play out in big companies, although I do think during COVID we're seeing some differences and some opportunity. Yeah, I think that a lot of people. That's very important to uh, to, to to see that uh, an, an, that analogy and uh, and know there are things we can do in all organisations. Uh, yeah. Learning from 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 your work. Another set of questions uh, which I think are quite timely uh, are to do with the idea that what you've been describing perhaps is that we've sort of baked in to our systems and processes uh, these kinds of biases that result in in, in the outcomes that that, that you're measuring. And you're talking about ways that we could perhaps relieve that. Are you seeing something, uh, and the, the, the equivalent of that coming through, you know, the increasing use of AI, machine learning, uh, all the sort of algorithmic approaches to decision making? Uh, and what's your response to, what should our response be to, to, to those concerns? Yeah. So I think it's really interesting because certainly when it comes to, for example, evaluating ideas, and again, I would see the evaluation of ideas, the decision to stop some, move some forward, add more resources to some, build teams, is an absolutely fundamental process in the innovation economy that happens in large corporations and governments, um, you know, in not-for-profits. And so I think these are really important central processes that we need to design. On the one hand, you can imagine, and we know that we increasingly are using machine learning to help us you know, weed out ideas just as we're using them with resumes for individuals, we're using them for ideas, uh, we're using them to sort of down select from a thousand new ideas and a crowdsourcing platform that we might have internally to a subset of ideas. That can, I think, be very powerful because it can push out some of the biases that we see. But we also need to recognize the two things. One is that we know that by gender, by background, by experience, people write differently. They express their ideas. And if all we're doing is crunching the numbers on the written expression of an idea, we're likely to see bias in what we find. And secondly, we also know, and there's some wonderful work by um, my colleague Danielle Lee uh, and our graduate student Lindsay Raymond about this, um, if we obviously use a training data set of things that we know were good ideas in the past, that set of ideas was probably, you know, ideas that were uh, developed by a certain category of individual. And so our algorithms are going to be biased to replicate the past. And so we do have to think about the fact that they're really powerful in helping us gather more ideas and perhaps finding patterns in them and getting new ideas out. But on the other hand, if we only use past data to train current uh, systems, we're going to replicate bias. And so we're simply going to bake uh, systemic bias into our algorithms. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, that's helpful. And just changing tack a little bit, 
you know, this is a, uh, in, in a way, a sort of a technical way of thinking about this topic. But what we all see in the headlines all the time is a very visceral kind of behavioral set of issues. Mm -hmm. And those no doubt are cultural as well, and they're cultural within particular industries and organizations, but they vary uh, internationally as well. How do you think about you know, that question of uh, the culture that you see in particular organizations or in fields and what can we do about it? So I think it's really important. I mean, culture is, you know, one of the foundational elements of how we understand any kind of group or organization. And culture often gets uh, expressed in a number of the ways that I've been talking about. So it gets expressed in the networks that we have. It gets expressed in who we invite to participate and share stories. It gets expressed in the kinds of questions that we ask. And so how adversarial we are when we're picking ideas. And so I think that many of the sort of micro elements that I've been talking about, you know, all accumulate together to then build a culture that is either pro innovation or not, and a culture that is inclusive of a large number of different and distinctive voices or not. Uh, and so, you know, what we're really aiming for, I think, in, in effective organizations that really lead inclusive innovation is a constructive culture um, among a connected community and a community that is able to have challenging conversations because innovation is all about ideas and ideas are uncertain and we need to be able to debate. So this isn't all about saying, oh, everybody is great and everybody's idea is wonderful. It's about how to create a culture where we can actually have exchanges on a sort of level playing field. And so I think really paying attention to that culture, to how we uh, celebrate and express what we're doing, how we ask each other hard questions, but that are not about who we are, but actually what our ideas are about think is really important. It is very difficult at the moment. I think, um, you know, all the social issues and the economic ones that are sort of intertwined in those make it incredibly, incredibly hard uh, for us to sort of step back and think about how we actually build an inclusive innovation economy. But I will say that over the medium to long run, you know, we do absolutely need to rebuild our economies. We need to rebuild our social fabric. And I think innovation and the positive hope that that brings is an incredibly important part of it. I've also been incredibly inspired by the diversity of people who have come forward with ideas that are helping us in the immediate COVID challenges. And some of those are the absolutely high science of the vaccines going on in teams around the world, all the way down to you know, um, students around the world finding 3D printers to 3D print um, uh, PPEs and masks. And so what I've seen in COVID actually is something that does actually feel a lot more inclusive. And it is that inclusion both globally, uh, different parts of our communities, uh, that I think is really a hopeful message for you know, a more globally inclusive innovation economy, as well as all the, as I say, rather hard-headed uh, kind of pieces, research-driven pieces of the puzzle that I've tried to share with us today. Great. What an optimistic, constructive and constructivist uh, no, to, uh, uh, to end on. We're, we're out of time, I'm afraid to say. It, the, the, the time does fly when we're having these fascinating conversations. Thank you so much, Fiona, for joining us. We know how busy you are and there are so many questions that we will uh, get to uh, trying to answer some of them in a blog article to follow up. Uh, one more uh, note, we'll have a special uh, webinar next week to mark the end uh, of the summer. Uh, but of course, it's not the end of the challenges that we're all facing. The pandemic is still with us. The economic uh, challenges that we have, the business challenges that we have are all with us. So we'll be continuing into the fall. But for next week, we'll have a special uh, session to mark the end of the summer. So watch your inboxes uh, for that. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, we really do appreciate you around the world taking the time to tune in uh, to this webinar or who would like to watch it recorded uh, afterwards. Uh, you are how we have impact in the world. Everything we do at MIT uh, really gets out into the world through uh, people like all of you who are listening to these webinars and attending our programs uh, and putting these ideas into practice. So thank you very much to all of you. Thank you, Fiona, uh, and I'll see you all soon. Thank you, Peter.